comes straighten up. Straighten your nose out. I know. Hey, straighten your nose out. Hey. Come on, we're about to go live. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh we are oh, live. Okay. Good morning. Hey, good morning to you. <laughs> good morning to, you, to all of you guys out there. Um, I'm Chris. This is John. We are traveling through the book of Romans together with you guys. Um, so thank you for being a part of this. It is truly a privilege of ours to be able to gather with you in this way. We look forward to a time when we can gather together. Um, but until then, we gather this way to share the gospel um, of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're just going to do a little bit of review from last week. Um, and then we'll jump into some new uh, passages that, um, or the new content of, of Romans this morning. Do we have any announcements? I don't know. Do we have any announcements? Do you need your Bible? They're, they're uh, looking at uh, you. That's okay. I have it printed here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, though. <laughs> that would have been an announcement. <laughs> yeah. if, um, John needs his Bible. Uh, I guess the only announcement we could do, I mean, there's a couple of them. We do have our dates for camp. Camping, yes. Yep, camping, not camp, camping. Um, June 23rd to the 26th. So if you want to be a part of that, hopefully the dates will be open. Put it on your open. calendar. Yeah. Yes. We don't have anything set up yet to like uh-uh. solicit input, but just put it on your calendar. Yep, because they're still saying there that uh, group sites aren't open. So mm-hmm. they, I, we can't even pay for it yet, Yeah. Okay. although it's reserved. Um, another one would be continue to take notes through Romans and mm-hmm. read it um, with us. Participate with us on it if you have questions or thoughts or comments. But we will also, when we do get together in one geographical location on Sunday mornings, we will double back on previously taught content of Romans and so that we can discuss it, talk about it, ask questions in that corporate environment. So That'll be fun. Yeah. I miss that. Me too. Yeah, totally. <laughs> the group and the questions and, you know, working through that stuff together. Yes. Yeah. This is not quite that. It's fun, you and I. Yeah. But- and it's fun to get questions from if people. If only but. they could have the same type of enjoyment that we have when well, we do it together. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's right. It's late at night, though. That's, that's like, true. It really is late. late. You might not, yeah. It's just, yep. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> I think that's it. Okay. You want to pray for us before we jump sure. in? Sure. Cool. God, thank you for the opportunity to be together uh, today, uh, virtually, for those that are online with us. Thank you, God, for uh, Maddie and Ethan and Aaron working uh, all of the technical stuff for us. Thank you for the opportunity that Chris and I have had over the past number of weeks to dive into uh, the book of Romans and to sort of dissect it uh, together. And Lord, we just pray that as we as we uh, cover this section of the passage that, uh, Lord, you would open our eyes to learn from your word, uh, that we would learn something not only that, that's theoretical, but we would learn something practical as well, and that we would uh, go from this time together uh, propelled to participate in your mission to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Um, thank you for bringing us together, God. We love you. In your name. Amen. Amen. So a little bit of uh, real brief background of where we've been so far. This is this letter written by Paul. Um, from the city of Corinth, probably around five, uh, 58 A.D., 59 A.D. Um, Paul had not, at this time when he wrote the letter, had not visited Rome, but he had a deep desire to do so. Mm. And Rome, uh, we won't say much about the city, but other than it's the, it was the political, financial, um, economical, religious sort of epicenter of this mighty Roman Empire that has, at, at its zenith, was the, the greatest empire of the time. And... Mm. Um, and so Paul writes and expresses a desire to go and visit them. Yet the, the gospel, it's sort of unique here. Paul knew that the church, the gospel, the church has already been planted. The gospel has already gone to Rome, unlike some of those other areas that he'd been to, Ephesus, Philippi, so on and so forth, Thessalonica. Um, but yet, nevertheless, Paul wanted to go. So he writes a letter prior to getting there. And so he, although he might have met some of the folks, as it may seem in at the end of uh, Romans 16. He might have met some of the people that were in Rome throughout his tra- his travels, or maybe heard of their stories. But he didn't uh, had not spent any time in Rome and any length of time with any of the believers in Rome. So he he sets out to write a letter that is pretty um, thorough explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and not just the gospel as in a one sort of sliver. But he's trying to give a a robust and thorough 
uh, understanding of this gospel. Mm -hmm. And in his introduction, we sort of see sort of the, the, the breadth and the depth of what Paul is talking about when he mm -hmm. says that this gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, um, that's the, sort of the meaning of the gospel. It's good news. And we're going to talk about the content <clears throat> as we travel through the book of Romans. Um, but the gospel, as Paul says in sort of these first couple verses in Romans, is that the ultimate source of the gospel is God himself. It's not man. It's not the writings of these people, which is a common misunderstanding or misrepresentation of the scriptures. That it, it sort of as we hear from Paul or we hear from Mark, we hear from Peter or John, that it's sort of their message. Mm -hmm. It's never been their message. They have been the messengers to carry the message of God because the gospel has always been rooted in God. That it was promised in the past. It's not something new or like God had to tweak it or it was born out of another philosophy or of another religion. But this, the promise of God f for the gospel predates all of that. This was the very first thing at the very, very for when it was only Adam and Eve, no other man or woman, child on the face of the earth, God promises that one will come to crush the head of Satan, and we see that fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Um, and then the, the gospel centers, the gospel is not a philosophy, it's not a way of life necessarily. It is, the, it is the person and the good news, it's information, truth about Jesus, his life, and his work, um, and we're going to we're, we're going to look at that in, a, in sort of this uh, in myriad of different ways uh, throughout the book of Romans, and then Paul in uh, you know verses three through four and five he talks about this Jesus not exhaustively but really covers some really some very important uh, truths about Jesus's identity. He was from the the line of David which has deep roots in the promises that God gave to David, that he would have someone sitting on his throne um, that, would, uh, that, would, uh, that would last forever. 2 Samuel 7, Jeremiah 32, 33. Um, so it talks about as he was fully human, that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament promises, that Jesus is fully divine, that he was not born um, in a, a normal way, but that it was he, through the spirit of, of holiness, he was declared to be the power, to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. So Jesus is fully divine. We see, we have no example of any human ever holding both obviously fully human and being fully God at the mm -hmm. same time. That is, a, that is unique to, to, he was not just a prophet or a good man or a moral being, that he, that he was, but that's to severely underestimate and to severely miss the point of who Jesus was. He was completely God and completely human. And I, I think we'd agree, right, John? That that's, I mean, to really wrap our minds around that, it's a very difficult thing because we have no experiential uh, evidence toward that. Like, mm -hmm. we've never met someone. Mm -hmm. You might meet someone who maybe claims mm -hmm. those things. But yeah, not to, ex to show the evidence of it. <clears throat> yeah, and I think um, just off the top of my head, I think of you know growing up, uh, growing up in a, in the church. Yeah, I would have probably more so learned about this element of it, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, the emphasis maybe more on Jesus as God, his his divinity, sure. rather than so much emphasis on the human, although. Obviously, as you look into it, it's it's that's uh, exceptionally important that he yeah. is, he has that yep. that as well because of what that means for what he does. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I feel I feel as though maybe in my personal experience, I as a child mm -hmm. at least that I would have understood Jesus more on the the divine side yeah. than the human side. Yeah, <clears throat> just as a as a point of emphasis. Maybe. Sure, totally. So, I, and I wonder, I, I, don't, I don't know, as you're just check, chatting through that, maybe it's because this is the more unbelievable mm -hmm. truth. We have extra biblical writings that actually mentions Jesus, mentions mm -hmm. the followers of Jesus. So the questioning of the historicity of Jesus, that this was a man that lived, yeah. maybe no one questions. Sure. But, but nevertheless, yeah. Oh, yeah. well, I just, yeah, it's, 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 that's important. It's not yeah. just a matter of fact, like 
he yeah. was born as a man. Yeah. It's that the element of him having that flesh and what that means when he dies. Yeah. Is, it's critical to the whole, yes. the way the thing works out. Right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, how could he be the sacrificial lamb of mm -hmm. God without him being human? Sure. You know, and how could he then say that um, I, I, I've sort of, when you go through life, mm -hmm. I can say that I empathize and I sympathize and I know what you're going through because he legitimately went through what we've gone through and more. Mm -hmm. The full weight of temptation he bore, the full weight of sin he bore, which we've never have. But you're right. And so super important to, yeah. to recognize this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then finally, Paul, in at the very end of 4 there, he, he sort of makes it crystal clear of who he's talking about. Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he puts those three uh, common ways of referring to Christ um, as his human name, his title, and then he's the Messiah, the one that God promised. So again, never, uh, never miss that um, the gospel is always about God and the scriptures are always about his gospel. It's, this is what Paul's trying to get to us. It's about God and his good news bound up in Jesus Christ. Um, and that's part of the reason we do all the highlighting. Yeah. Because when you do highlight, you see, oh boy, God's yep. everywhere in it, uh -huh. just in the words. Yep. And in this passage from verses 1 through one through 17, we've got the gospel mm -hmm. stated four times. Yep. Yes. Was that, was that the one that we were like? Yeah. Because it's was double it five stated. Or, yeah, right here. Two. Right? Yeah. The second one. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Oh, five times. I'm sorry. One, two, it's either five or four, depending on the translation. But. Yeah. Point is, it's emphasized, especially here in these first exactly. few, few verses. Yep. And Paul, in a sense, is going to, for this next 16 chapters of the book of Romans, is going to elaborate on that gospel. Unpack And it. who yeah. God is in the gospel. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. So, we, I think we, last week we left off at four, so maybe should we just sort of pick up from there? Dive into five. Yeah, you want to read it sure. for us? All right. Uh, through him, verse five, Romans chapter one, verse five. Through him and for his name's sake... We received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Grace and peace to you from, our, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. For all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Quick thought. Yep. We talked about this as we prepared for this, mm -hmm. and I'm just reminded at, in reading through it, this is a letter. Yeah. And that it is important to read it as such, right? Yeah. Uh, although we're going to put the patient on the table and dissect it. Yep. <laughs> together. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Um, it's, I'm often reminded how important it is to, when, when you're looking at letters, to read them as a letter. Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy to get, to dive down into the minutia and get lost in the minutia mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, lose lose the the overall essence of what's being said what's yep. being communicated yep. because you have it's it's more of a holistic thing it's not 
It's not one word at a time. He's sure. saying these things. He's writing these things as a letter. Yep. You know, and, and if you think about how we would write a letter, if we were to write, write a letter, for example, I've received a lot of cards. We've received a, a bunch of cards mm -hmm. lately. Sure. Really uh, amazing, thoughtful things from people. And But if you were to take a, a letter like that that says, I'm sorry for your loss, and you sort of dissect one word at a time, you would miss the whole meaning of the letter. Yeah. You know. Um, so anyway, just something we talked about, yeah. we reminded ourselves of, and I'm reminded of that as I read through that. that That's good. It's important to uh, consider it that way, see yep. it through that lens. I, I remember years ago being encouraged to read um, these letters and to try it, reading it in one sitting. Mm. One, because that's what we do with our letters, mm -hmm. right? We don't like read a paragraph and then stop and then read it tomorrow and then, you know, from yeah. where we left off. Right. And two, <laughs> what would have been done if this Roman church would have received this letter? Can you imagine the anticipation, the eagerness they would have to go to just to continue on? Yeah. The person, the, 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 the man or the woman that would stand up before them and read this letter and he's got, well, okay, come back next week and we'll finish this. <laughs> to be continued. Yeah, they'd be like, wait, no, like, this is, this is Paul, you know, and we want to hear from the Lord, you know. So um, I think it's good. And that might be even an encouragement for us. Mm -hmm. And to sit down and read this letter as a whole. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, cool. good point. Should we jump back to verse 5 okay, there? verse 5. Yeah. So now we'll put the patient we'll on Put the patient the, on the... Table. After saying all that. Yes, after saying that, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so verse 5. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about a couple things that we have uh, looked at here. Yeah. First and foremost is maybe that word we... Mm -hmm. receiving grace and apostleship. Who is the we there? And maybe what do we understand? Because of, you know, once we know who the we is, what do we understand the, sure. uh, them to be receiving? Yeah, there's different interpretations on that. And I, here's, I, I think contextually we can sort of rule out one. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to sort of share what I think is, uh, is where I think our position is on it yeah. as we've studied through it. Um, and I think the we there is it. There's we see Paul in, in other writings and in, in, in Romans he does this as well. He uses the we in like a literary uh, sort of editorial plural, like, okay. but he's speaking of himself, you know. And that that was a very way, common way of writing actually in Greek at the time, is that when you're speaking of yourself, you can say that we. It's sort of this editorial literary device to um, speak of yourself in a letter. Mm. I don't think that's what he's. he's I do saying. that sometimes when I write. Do you? Still, yeah. Okay. Say we. I'm yeah. Just talking about me. Yeah, totally. Not people don't always understand what I'm what I'm doing there, yeah. but I'm like I'm just following after Paul. There you go. Yeah. So. Good, good for you. I feel like when I speak to like when like when especially with my wife sometimes they say hey we should we should we should do this I'm always speaking of her. <laughs> And that's not a good idea. By saying we, I mean you. Hey, yeah, we yes. should we should like you know work outside in the yard, you know, like oh, you know, oh, you there's know. a football game on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh, okay. I do the I do the inverse here. But anyways, um, so this is more. Would you say that's more of a a, a thing that was done in in those yeah. times? Yeah, is that's it, common. It, okay. Yeah, it's a very common thing. Okay. It, and it, again, this is very common outside of the writing of Paul. It okay. just wasn't like you know. You know, Paul, this was a very common way of doing it. Okay. But I think the way that we can interpret this best is I think this is Paul and the we there. He's speaking to, speaking about himself mm -hmm. and the other apostles. Okay. Um, and we know that other apostles were, you know, obviously apostles to the Jews, specifically James and uh, uh, Peter. But we also know the other apostles, there's many other apostles that were to the Gentiles. We see that early on in the book of Acts. We see that through, um, you know, like Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch, so on and so forth, John and, and others um, that were apostles. And yet at the same time, were also apostles to the Gentiles. So Paul, it's like Paul wasn't the only one to go to the Gentiles. We see the gospel moving out. Um, and certainly Paul was... Uh, used by God in a very significant way um, to not only pen 13 letters, um, but to go to the Gentile people. And he saw himself as his main target audience were the non-Jews. Mm -hmm. um, so 
But again, it's in the same in the in the inverse way. It wasn't Paul was saying I didn't minister to the Gentiles. Oh, the, sorry, the Jews, mm -hmm. because when he would go to the Gentile cities, he would first go to the synagogues often, and find himself sort of reaching out to the Jews first. But then, after their rejection, he would mm -hmm. move on to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. and we see a good portion of his ministry reaching out to them. So. I think the we there is, speaking of the apostles, sort of the strict, sort of the, the narrow view of what the apostles were, Paul and the other apostles, not the, the sort of third person inclusive, like including the Romans. Okay. In part because in verse 6 he says, right, he says, and, and you, he you. Yeah. Right. right? So we see that he's saying we and then the you. It would yep. be sort of weird to go we inclusive and then go to say you. Right. So, um, okay. yeah, I think in, that's in part. Yeah. In the... Uh, uh, what was I going to ask? Um, I lost my thought. That's okay. We receive grace and apostleship, call people from all the Gentiles. I was thinking about the, yeah, I guess the element of uh, apostleship also including sort of a target audience. Mm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. um, in some cases that maybe, do you think that that was clear to each apostle that they sort of had specific audience that they were being um, that, that was part of that role that they were filling. Yeah, sort of like their normative audience. Because yeah. I, I mean, what's interesting they just kind of like happen naturally based on. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question, and I don't know how to f maybe to fully answer that. Mm -hmm. But I, I think at, at the same time, I would say Paul saw himself as going to the Gentile nations, of course. But like I mentioned, he also saw himself as going to the Jews, as he did. Mm -hmm. And on, on the other side, if you look at Peter, Peter and James, we certainly see them, the vast majority of their ministry is, is ministering to the Jewish uh, people in Jerusalem. But nevertheless, we can't think that they didn't reach out to the Gentiles because in Acts 10, we mm -hmm. see that God helps Peter come to this realization that, um, that he wanted the gospel to go to the Gentiles and then Peter now is sent to the Cornelius. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, I think it goes both ways, okay. but I think in a normative way, yeah, we would say that Paul was sort of the Gentile the apostle to the Gentiles, sent yeah. out. And that's what the apostle is, is, is a sent out one or a missionary to those people. Mm -hmm. um, but, but nevertheless, uh, and as he'll say here at the end of his introduction, he was for the Jew and for the Gentile, you know, okay. so, yeah. Cool. All right. What else in verse five there that we um, said about it? I think that's yeah, probably. Just the we was yeah. kind of the thing. Um, one thing that when we looked at this before, we received grace and apostleship or uh, the grace of apostleship. Yeah. We sort of talked about how yeah. that that might be a little bit, um, maybe helps us understand it a little better if we kind of read it a couple of different ways. Yeah, so. I, I actually think it's, it, and that word and can be translated in a number of different ways. Um, so I think it's actually maybe a better, and I think there's biblical support to this, it's the grace of apostleship. Paul always saw ministry as a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't see it that way, so it's hard for us to think that <laughs> this is this the ministry of, of loving others and uh -huh. sharing the gospel because mm -hmm. maybe there's tension, maybe there's fear, maybe there's we, we recognize the risk, we know that we might be giving up something, and mm -hmm. it's a call to sacrifice. It's a call to, to, as Paul would say, to be a servant of Christ. So we see sort of the heaviness, the mm -hmm. dutiness of that. Yeah. And Paul didn't see that. He saw it as a grace of God because I think in part because he was overwhelmed by the goodness of God in the gospel. So the gospel saved him. That's a gift. Mm -hmm. And God in that same vein gives him another wonderful gift. And it's a gift of ministry of sharing the greatest news of salvation, of freedom, of reconciliation, of mm -hmm. unity and harmony with the masses. And he would say, and in other places, like in, in Corinthians, in his writings to the Corinthian church, he says, this grace that has been given to me, I've been now sent, I've sent, uh, I was sent to you. So he's saying, mm -hmm. I've been sent to you, and that's a gift of God. You know, um, I, I think it's appropriate for us to see it that way as well. Um, yeah is that although we might not be, in a strict sense, the apostles, you know, but we, like we mentioned last week, the prophets and the apostles were the foundation of the church, and now we have the superstructure building on that same, same foundation. Mm -hmm. But it's the grace of God that we get the privilege of doing that with others mm -hmm. and share Jesus with others. others yeah. yeah, I know personally I, I have to remind myself of that or be reminded of that and re remember to be thankful that 
we get to participate in what God's doing, we consider it a privilege to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy. That doesn't always come just, yeah. you know. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's being reminded of what, it, the, you know, the, the gravity of it and also what that means for us and then the fact that we get to be a part of it. Um, yeah. But it th doesn't come in always naturally. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I, I like Paul. it this way. And maybe I, I just thought of this. So this uh, might break down. Yeah, okay. It probably does break down really quick. But can you imagine if you were standing in, a, in the mass of 100 people and you have LeBron James who's picking his team mm -hmm. to play basketball with. And, and, he's, and he would pick you first. Mm -hmm. You'd pick us first, you know. And how privileged we would be mm -hmm. like, dude, we get to play with one of the Mm -hmm. greatest basketball players ever <laughs> and we sort of get to ride his coattails and sort of give him the ball and watch yeah. him do his thing <laughs> you know like in a sense in, in a very crude way that's a very crude illustration yeah. Yeah. but like the privilege of jo joining Jesus in his mission mm -hmm. that he says not only saves us but he now says I want I want you to participate mm -hmm. in the greatest thing ever that it not only transformed you and and has a it has inst it, it built up for you by my work a destiny that is secure so and so much more mm -hmm. but now you get the privilege of being a part of that with me with other people yeah and i think that's that's an important point to make here i think in looking at this verse because he's not just saying you know we've received the grace the grace in period yeah. Saying no, the grace of apostleship is to call people. Yeah, it's to be going and doing something yeah. about this, right? Yeah, totally. It's, that's the package that's that he's really referring to yep. there. And I think even like experientially in my life, some of the greatest joys that I've mm -hmm. had is seeing sort of the spiritual lights turn on, not only in my family, mm. um, but also in other people. And Paul talks about this in First Corinthians nine: is that I would check it to share in the blessings of the gospel. And that's the context of sharing the gospel to other people. He's mm -hmm. already saved. And of course he's sharing in the, to get the blessing of the gospel in his own life. But the context of 1 Corinthians 9 is he's saying, he's saying, I became a Jew to win the Jew, a Gentile to win the Gentile, weak to save the weak, mm -hmm. so that I might save some. And I enjoy, I, I get to receive the blessing of the gospel in other people's lives. And so like Paul is writing this from like also this, it is the, the most beautiful, grand thing for people to know that God is on their side mm -hmm. and save them through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes cool. we look at the obstacles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paul, what Paul is saying, I'm, not, I'm looking through the obstacles, sure. through the lens of the gospel, that this is a gift to actually be going toward people with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. Yeah. Just keep moving, because yeah, otherwise yeah. We'll, we'll get to <laughs> yeah. three verses this week. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but We're before we move on, yeah. do we, <laughs> do we, Let's keep moving do we want to talk about the, the last portion of that verse, obedience that comes from faith? How about this? Let's, let's say no. Let's circle back to it. It's, uh, yeah, we'll, let's just say no. We'll come, ba we'll <laughs> okay, come back okay, to it. Okay. I, probably what's going to happen is people are going to go, ah, oh, you should have said something. I had yeah. a question about that. Yeah, yeah. We'll come back okay, to it okay. another time. All right. Verse 7? No, verse 6. Why are you jumping Verse 6. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. And you, uh -huh. okay, here's where now he's referring to his audience, yep. the Romans, yep. are also among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Yep. Uh, anything to be said there, you think? Yeah, I just think that Paul recognizes that they, were, they belong to Jesus Christ. And this is one of the, the aspects of the gospel. Mm -hmm. we, can get, we, can, we can lose sight of belonging to mm -hmm. him. That is, and Paul is going to talk about the beauty, the wonder of not only what it means and the results of that, but how that happened through the book of Romans. How did we come into this belonging relationship with Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. That Jesus Christ said early on to his disciples that I am in you and you are in me. He prays about that. He talks about that. And, we're, and Paul is going to expound on that beautiful truth. And I think this is one of the, one of the, the yearnings and what our world is constantly seeking after. And they go through so many, they go through a myriad of avenues and travel down a myriad of roads to seek a belonging, an yeah. acceptance. And what Paul is saying here is that you belong to Jesus Christ. Now, this might be a new concept to them. We don't know. 
or maybe they were already well versed in this. But nevertheless, he doesn't question it. He doesn't wonder it. He doesn't ensure that, hey, you did this, so God did that. It's, he's just stating a truth mm-hmm. that you belong to Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the feeling of security, of acceptance, of love, knowing that you are belonging mm-hmm. to the one that not only came and saved you, but the one that created it all. And I think, I mean, for you and I, um, believers today, I mean, should take stock of that, rest in that, um, be reminded of that over and over and over again. But I just, I think this is a, 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 a sort of an introduction mm-hmm. of how did that happen? What are the results of that? How do we live in that? Paul is going to address that all through the book of Romans. So okay. stay tuned for Paul ex- More. exhaustively going over that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. Look at that. We, we, we went through one verse. You did. That minutes. was good. Yep. <laughs> to all in Rome who are, verse 7, to all, who, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is mm-hmm. sort of just the, the greeting yeah. as, he, as he prepares to dive into yep. the totally. world's deepest letter yeah uh yeah go ahead. so maybe we'll, we'll address something really quick and yeah. i think it connects to the idea of belonging yep, when saints. yeah the idea of saints mm-hmm. one notice mm-hmm. that it's plural it's not singular oftentimes we have for whatever reason and this is not blaming anyone or any group or whatever we've off, we often look at the idea of saints as in the singular mm-hmm. you'll never see that concept singular in the scriptures actually it's always plural so he's talking about believers, whether he's writing to the church in Ephesus, which he uses that word as well, mm-hmm. writing to the church, the church in, in uh, Corinth, he uses that term as well. He's saying that you were all saints. You were all set apart ones for Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ. And what, why I think that's important is oftentimes we're told that we, we speak of this word saint in the singular. Mm-hmm. We go, that's St. That's, that's Saint Paul or St. Saint Mary or St. Saint Peter or St. James speaking in the singular. Mm-hmm. Um, Paul is talking about the plural. All of you who have placed your faith in Rome that belong to God are saints, plural. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's an important thing. Another concept in there, and you, you and I have journeyed through this, that the two words that precede that word, saints, to be, yeah. are not actually in the Greek. Now, again, I'm not going to beat up on the translators here because translation is a very hard thing to do. And we have very good translations in the scriptures. No one should be questioning the translations of the, the vast majority of the English translations. So that's not my heart at all. Mm-hmm. But really, how that's read there, it said, to all those in Rome who, be- who are loved by God and called saints, mm-hmm. who are saints, and this is not a to be, like it's a future thing. Mm-hmm. It's he, Paul is reassuring and stating a statement of fact, you are saints. And I think it goes back to this idea that you belong to Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if, it, it can, if you have a misconception or preconception about the saint element of it, yeah. and then you read called to be saint, so if you think of a saint as some sort of, elevated position yeah. and I'm now called to be that that you sort of travel down a completely different path if, totally. you, if you really yep. get mistaken there yeah. Right? yeah and I think what we do is like when we talk about St. Paul St. Peter St. all these other saints we there is a we, we are instantly create a chasm between us and them and that chasm is usually based upon how holy or not mm-hmm. am I compared right. to that person right. and so now that the focus now turns on me to be more like St. Paul is to be more holy, more righteous, more... Right. And it yeah. turns to the ethical living, the moral achievements that we, we need to have, or mm-hmm. we, and there we don't, therefore we don't have. He's not saying that. What's ironic about this, <clears throat> he doesn't know them all that well, right? He's not saying that I know your religious mm-hmm. rituals, I know your religious activities, I know your moral, moral achievements. He's saying, I know your faith. Yeah. You put your faith in the gospel, therefore I know what is true of you. You are a saint. Mm-hmm. You belong to Christ and you're a saint. Yeah. So I think t- today you and I, mm-hmm. although we don't talk this way, 
Yeah. We need to see ourselves because of the work of Jesus Christ. And Paul's going to say, and you might be going, okay, what work and how did that all happen? He's going to, we'll talk about that. We'll get there over the coming two years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but he's going to explain more what it means to be belong to God. He's going to mm-hmm. explain more how do we become a saint that rests, all this work rests solely upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, okay, good. Yep. Moving along. Grace yeah. and peace to you from God our Father. From the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. Boom. Peace. Mm-hmm. Grace and peace. Yep. Good. We'll we'll come back to that too. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Okay. So yep. let's go to let's go to eight. Peace will be will be in verse uh, <clears throat> chapter five. Grace will be all over the all over the place. Yep. Okay. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Uh, so one of the things I was sort of curious about here is, mm-hmm. what's the cultural, what's the sort of level of cultural persecution that's being experienced by um, Christians at this at this time? We sort of talked briefly through that. Yeah. Um, just sort of out of curiosity, what, what's historically what's happening at this moment in time? Is is Paul writing to a heavily persecuted church, or is he writing? Are they are they hiding? Are they? I know they're you know their home churches. We talked yeah. about that. Yeah. Is there is there an element of persecution? Yeah. I would think so. Yeah. Uh, it's unlike the, persec- the persecution that they endured at, th- at this time mm-hmm. would be unlike probably the persecution that we d- we, we endured simply because of the context why that they lived in that we lived in are different. Mm-hmm. One being, okay, Nero is is the, the emperor of Rome at this time. Now we all know if we know a little bit about Roman history and cr- the, the Christian sort of the, the checkered history of the Ro- of the of the Christian history through the uh, empire uh, the emperor of Rome Nero. Nero was one of the most heinous uh, emperors and most f- furious toward the Christians, but that had not happened yet. Right, few years later. Yeah, the, the burning of Rome, um, which I think is in, you know, I talked about, check me, historians check me on this, I think, think 64. Yeah. yeah, and Nero blamed the burning of Rome um, mm-hmm. on the Christians. Mm-hmm. And so at that, then he turned really, now the, all the stories that we hear about these, these, the heinous acts mm-hmm. of, you know, sort of lighting the city with the, the, the flesh of the, the mm-hmm. Christians and all so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. We won't get into that. Yeah. That wasn't until maybe five or six years later after Paul wrote this. Yeah. However, we got to, Ro, the, the Romans, again, saw that this Christian movement was from this guy named Jesus in the little town of Bethlehem sort of this off scaring off you know this, the marginalized people they mm-hmm. didn't really take much you know stock in it and at the same time they had this a totally different idea and world view they would never have said Jesus was god and so the idea that he would claim that um, is like anathema to them yeah, yeah. you know so certainly they weren't like embracing this christian faith yeah. and more like as maybe our culture does now now we might all can talk <laughs> about how it's maybe moving away from that nevertheless yeah. They lived in an environment where the, the powers that be certainly did not embrace the faith of these folks. Mm-hmm. And this was not a recognized religion. That was 300 years later until, you know, when Constantine would finally recognize Christianity um, as the sort of the Roman, the, the Roman religion, mm-hmm. which that in and of itself has problems, but that's, <laughs> that's for another mm-hmm. um, day. Okay, cool. Yep. Uh, so Paul's thankful that yeah. the the faith that the Romans are having is being yeah. shared around the world. Totally. Okay. And that around the world, you know, it's more, there's hype, there's different literary devices in the scripture and mm-hmm. hyperbole is one of them. And that's yeah. Paul's hyperbole. Let's not assume here that it's, uh, it's all around the world, like all known places mm-hmm. that we now know of, you know, Latin America, South America, you know, um, you know, the, the Asian, you know, Southeast Asia, so on and so forth, the island groups, Africa, so on and so forth. We, we know that this was not spread throughout the world. I think what Paul is talking about is the known world, the yeah. Roman Empire as we know it then. Um, but yet the work of getting to the gospel to the ends of the earth did not happen in Paul's lifetime. Um, there, therein lies sort of the challenge for you and I today. The work, <clears throat> st- the work still to be had. Still to be done. Okay. Yeah. All right, so verse 9, God whom I serve with... My whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you. Mm-hmm. So what in the heck is he meaning by my whole heart or like in, let's see, the NLT, what does he say there? Uh, yeah, same thing. I my serve heart. with all my heart yeah. or 
in other translations, in my, my spirit. spirit. Yeah. So what? How are we to understand what the, what he's trying to convey there? I think the best way maybe to understand that is my, my whole being. The okay. idea of the heart back then is not, it's a little bit different than ours. Mm-hmm. Like we, we feel like the heart is the seat of our emotions. Maybe more aptly put in the writing of more, especially in the Hebrew sense. Um, but yet the Greeks, because of they valued wisdom so much, um, that the, the heart would be more the epicenter of their thoughts, sort of the, the seat of their thoughts. But really, it's the idea at the core of the essence of who I am. I serve God with all my being. Okay. So not just my, the physicalness of my body, um, the tangible ways, but also in the immaterial ways. Of This, this starts from the inside out, mm-hmm. and uh, that's how I serve. Um, and... and- and the sun is my witness of how much I re- remember you. Yeah. Just sort of endearing himself, expressing that level of concern that Paul has had for for the Romans. Yeah, totally. And he's going to go on here to say how much he's been longing to yeah. come to see them. Yeah. I, I, I've always wondered, and I don't know the answer to this, why, why was he so, why did he yeah. want to go to Rome yeah, yeah. so bad? Because you don't see this in other cities. Mm-hmm. Of course, you went to other cities. Mm-hmm. But why Rome? And maybe we can come with speculation, not, and maybe we can come up with those. But it just, it's just interesting that Paul would have such a yearning for a people mm-hmm. that he never met. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't think it's like, hey, I want to go visit Rome because I want to go on vacation and mm-hmm. see the, sort of the, the, the grandeur of Rome's mm-hmm. architecture or maybe why, maybe why we would visit Rome sure. today. Yeah. It's, it's rooted in the gospel mm-hmm. toward people. And that's what sort of the beauty of it, you know. And maybe that in, there lies sort of the why, but mm-hmm. I still feel that there's some unanswered questions there. Why Rome as yeah. opposed to any other place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. So and it's just been an interesting thing for mm-hmm. me. You know? We don't have much information. We don't outside of it. Yeah, okay. totally. Um, so I, I, God is, uh, I'm serving God with my whole heart. The Son is my witness about how I constantly remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray now that, that at last, yep. by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. So, yeah, he's, yep. he's got that longing. He's hoping that it's going to happen eventually. But in the meantime, I'm yep. going to go ahead and write this letter for you. Totally. Yep. Okay, so 11. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Twelve, that is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Okay, so what's the... We, we, we ha, are familiar with this idea of spiritual gifts. Yeah. Uh, is he talking about specific spiritual gifts here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's, or what is, what is some spiritual gift? Does that mean <laughs> some vague, uh, in, uh, nondescript spiritual gift? What, what is he yeah. saying there? I don't, that's a good question. I, I that's, think, a, that's a green highlight for me. What do you mean, Paul? Yeah, totally. So I think when we look at, so what, what, we ask the question, what's the purpose of Paul's desire for mm-hmm. going? Mm-hmm. Again, this is a little bit different than the question before, why Rome? But this sure. is, he's saying, this is why I want to come to you guys. Um, and there's three things, I think, that as, as I see and as you and I have talked through this, mm-hmm. um, verses 11, 12, and 13 sort of highlight the three things. So, so maybe just by three words. First is he wants to strengthen them. Okay. Second, he wants to encourage them. And third, he wants to have a harvest. So strengthen, encourage, and harvest. Okay. So let's just talk about those Ethan, first. Ethan, you got that? <laughs> Strength, <laughs> strengthen, <laughs> encourage, encourage, and harvest. harvest yeah. <laughs> you can just, I'm just giving each jot those down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so verse 11 says strengthen. Verse 12 says uh, uh to encourage, mm-hmm. the mutual encouragement, and then verse 13 is harvest. All right, so to go back to your question really quick, you know, to impart a spiritual gift, this is not talking about spiritual gifts it, like proper okay. or in a, in, a, in a strict sense of maybe if you're familiar with, you know, maybe a little bit of the teaching on the spiritual gifts of the church, that the, the gift, the Spirit gives gifts to people. 1 Corinthians 13, Romans 12, Ephesians 4 talks about sort of spiritual gifts. That's not what Paul is talking about here. And the reason why I say that is, in Romans 12, he'll say that you already have these gifts. Mm-hmm. And remember, this letter is going to um, get there before he does. So he's not saying, he already recognizes they have spiritual gifts. They already have them, he, therefore he can't bring them. Ex- yeah, exactly. Or bring it. 
Yeah, and it, so man is never sense. the agent of these spiritual gifts that God talks about. Okay. I think what he's just talking about, contextually, we would say, the spiritual gift, I think in maybe we'd be safe to say that it's encouragement. Because mm-hmm. yeah. right there in 12, it says, that is, that you and I will be mutually encouraged. So we might not, and this is where, where we need to redefine maybe what it means to, to have like a spiritual ministry in people's lives. Mm-hmm. Do we see encouragement as in a spiritual ministry in people's lives? And Paul wanted to bring that, and he wanted to receive that. And I, I love the humility of Paul through the lens of the gospel here, is that he didn't see him outside of the reach of encouragement. Mm-hmm. He saw that people, God's church, can have an impact in this great you know, <laughs> leader of the early church, He was normal, just like you and I. He recognized that he needed other brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage him. And he saw that the encouragement of the Lord comes through the church. So he he could be that encouragement to others, and others can be that encouragement to him. And I just love that. And it coincides also with Paul's writing when he talks about comfort. Yeah. You know, may the God of comfort comfort you so that you can comfort other people. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, when we're asking something from God, we're, f- we're forgetting that maybe the, the medium by which that comes mm-hmm. is the church. So if, you, if we need to be comforted, are we open for others to comfort us with the comfort of God? Mm-hmm. If we need to be encouraged, are we open to receive the encouragement of God through the church. That is a spiritual gift, as Paul would say. And I, I, just, I just love the humility of Paul there. I also love the impact. I think someone even in our, as we as a core team talked about this, is the beauty and the necessity of the church. You know, we don't grow alone. Yeah. In a sense, like we don't have the God just encourage me and have this weird expectation that just it's just a me and God thing. It's maybe through you and I living life together, being mm-hmm. present with each other, wading through life together, rejoicing with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. We can be God's comfort mm-hmm. through the power of the Spirit, be God's encouragement through the power of the Spirit. Paul saw that his arrival in Rome, he would receive encouragement and he would also be the avenue by which the church would be encouraged. Mm-hmm. Good. Yep. And to say this, this is not reserved for the spiritual elite, right? We, sure. we probably would all go, of course Paul's going to be an encouragement to the church. Yeah, yeah. Right? We go, he, he's, that's what he does, yeah, right. you know? Of, cur- of course the, the pastor of the church is going to be an encouragement to the church mm-hmm. because that's what they get paid for or mm-hmm. whatever it may be. It, that's such a misconception here because he sees that same type of ministry happening to him from other people. He didn't even know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? So I, I just, we're in this together. Hmm. And it reminds me, sorry, <laughs> it reminds me, oh uh, man, can I, can I just read this? Um, Please do. Yeah. It's, it reminds me of Ephesians. The, the beauty of the body of Christ. It says, Ephesians 4, 16 says, From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds. Some would say that's the same word of encouragement. Builds itself up in love as each part, that's you and I, Mm -hmm. each part of the body, each part does its work. So what Paul is doing, he's saying, I desire to come to do my work, and I know that God's going to do his work through you to be also an encouragement to me. And Paul saw that as a mutual encouraging, a mutual building up of the church in love. And we have both. We all play a role in that. Not the professional down to the non-professional. Mm-hmm. It's it's erode. We need to get rid of that idea that we do that together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We build each other up in love and encouragement as we all do our part. Mm-hmm. So the question would be, in a sense, is are you allowing God to do His part through you to encourage and build up His church? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Would you, so, would you say that the harvest is referring also to that mutual encouragement? I, I, I think so. Okay. Yep. Um, Strengthen, encourage, harvest, but really all of those are mm-hmm. different ways of referring to this 
building up this mutual encouragement that's going to take sure, place. Sure, totally. Yeah, and, and it's harvest, like here, I mean, sometimes that harvest can be like, we, like, we want the, the numerical number of people mm -hmm. to place their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. Of course, that's a desire we all do want. But Paul, I think we, it's, he, he's talking about here is sort of this spiritual growth and deepening of the church. Okay. And let me say this, though. Those things can go hand in hand, but you can't have one without the other. What I mean by that is if we desire for the, new, the church to grow numerically, it has to be upon the foundation of the spiritual growth of the church. Hmm. It's not through methods and strategies and campaigns and whatever it may be. It's through as we deepen and or strengthen and encourage in our faith and we are fr more frequently <laughs> trusting God in our life, we will see that the gospel will be lived out and communicated through us to people. And the result of that is, and it could be numerical growth. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we focus upon numerical growth and we miss the foundation of it, which is spiritual depth of maturity. And I think so as, so we need to focus as, as I think as leaders in the church and, and, and brothers and sisters in Christ with other people, it's not necessarily on the numerical growth. We focus on the, what Paul would say, or in his writings, the equipping and the edifying of the church for the saints to do the work of the ministry so that we grow in the unity of faith, becoming mature in Christ. It's maturity that we focus upon, and through that is a healthy outflowing of the gospel to other people. We can't help. We can't help to be just living it out. I almost mm -hmm. see it as sort of, as, as we were young children, and we mature into adulthood, mm -hmm. we can't help to be adults yeah. in a sense, right? Yeah, because yeah. we've matured into adults. We don't like pretend to be something that we're not. Well, we're just living as adults because we've matured into adults. As we mature into the image of Christ, mature into in, in He being the goal of maturity, it just becomes sort of natural in a sense, although we see it supernatural through the Spirit, but it's just natural that the gospel now is the outflowing of our heart to other people mm -hmm. and people get to experience experience God through our life. So, um, yeah. Amen. All right. Good deal. <laughs> Amen. All right. Can we move forward? Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. We, we got to get to the end because that's, yeah, that's when it really starts getting deep. And we yeah, we were actually going to spend more time on these last verses. Yeah, we were, we're going to try to get to 16 and 17. Yeah. So Make buckle that. up. We're staying for another hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, boy. All right. Um... So let's go to 14. I yeah. am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. Yep. So again, we're, we're reminded that Paul has a special sensitivity to mm -hmm. the Gentiles. Um, what do you, is there anything else to make out of that statement in 14? Yeah, it's it's interesting there. I mean, I think the, the really the focus is. I mean, now Paul will say later that he, you know, he first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, where we see that there's no like ethnic or racial uh, um, favoritism here mm. yeah. in the gospel. All this is the, this is the thing for all people, which I think Everybody. our 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 church needs to hear today over sure. and over and over again. <laughs> Paul saw himself he because he saw the gospel for all people. Mm -hmm. no human distinction should ever stand in the way of us putting up barriers between another group of people, whether it's political distinctions that we have, ethnic or racial distinctions, linguistical distinctions, um, age distinctions, <laughs> gender distinctions, lifestyle distinctions. Mm -hmm. They're not as holy as I am, therefore home, I, I, just, I can't. No, yeah. none of that. Mm. Um, I mean, even here, as, as we get into 14, he's just talking about, the, the, it's really the word non-Greeks non there is sort of the barbarians or those who aren't the educated ones. Mm -hmm. Now, again, think about Greek context where education, philosophy, wisdom was so, so adamantly adhered to by mm -hmm. the Greeks, by the Romans. Um, again, the epicenter of education and philosophy in, in this metropolitan city of Rome. Um, so Paul is saying that I'm obligated in a sense, that, that word actually is I'm, I'm a debt. I'm in debt to 
the Greeks, those who had philosophy, the wise, and also the, the barbarians, those who we, you guys, maybe we would see sort of the marginalized due to their, their academic um, the, the, or their, their, their education or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. Even those that you would see are sort of second-class citizens, the gospel goes to them as well. Mm -hmm. So he, he's just saying in 17, he says, or in, in 16, he's going to say to the Jew and the Gentile, no mm -hmm. ethnic you know, division, or socioeconomic status distinction. Uh, those distinctions are arbitrary. They're human. They are just divisions, and they're not healthy to live by. He's saying the gospel goes to all people. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he saw himself as obligated to those people. What, what's the, in, the indebtedness? I, so, yeah, it's a good question. What does that mean? Yeah, I, I think what he's saying is, I think it's in part of two things. One, because he's been taken and overwhelmed by the gospel mm -hmm. and how the gospel has radically transformed his life. He saw and experienced the power of God and he wants that for other people. And I think in part, he's saying that too because of God's grace of appointment of an apostle to the Greeks. Mm -hmm. You know, so he, I think what he's saying is, he says, I see that God has called me. God has uh, given me this grace to go, this free gift of ministry to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And I'm an, ob I'm an obligation to that because God called me to that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, uh, yeah, that'd be, uh, I think that's what it, he's referring to Okay. Uh, you know, in short. Yeah. So before we move past 15 to really dive into 16 yeah. and 17 for the next hour, <laughs> yeah. um, one thing that you and I sort of talked a lot about, I guess, was mm -hmm. in 15, the, you know, he's, he's e eager to preach the gospel to you who are, are at Rome. Yeah. The recipients of this letter are people who are already believers. Yeah. They're already you know, follow, followers of Christ. And, and yet, yeah. he is saying, I am going to preach the gospel to you. Mm -hmm. So if we gloss over that, we go, okay, whatever, yep. keep moving. But if you think about it, mm -hmm. why would believers need the gospel to mm -hmm. be preached to them? Yeah. Well, we, we conclude maybe that there's something, there's something to that. There's something to the gospel being preached to people who have already believed in it. Yeah. That we be, uh, that being reminded of it mm -hmm. is important for us, totally. even as believers. Yep. So, Elaborate, please. Yes. Tour guide. It's, it's interesting, too, because he, when, when he says, you belong to God, you're a saint, and your faith has been known throughout the world. Okay. So why would Paul preach the good news to those people who've already accepted it? And we know they're already belonging to God, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's probably two possible interpretations. One is, one possible interpretation could be that somehow or some way um, that they've misunderstood the gospel, so Paul has to bring some clarity to it. Okay. Now we see no evidence of that in the book of the in the book of Rome that he's going to rebuke them or correct them for misconceptions that they have about the. But we see that elsewhere. We do see that elsewhere, like in First Corinthians. Okay. Ironically, a church that he planted. <laughs> I don't know what that tells you. <laughs> well, you know, we all, all yeah, all of them go different directions. That's, that's it doesn't true. Matter who planted it. Yep. Yeah. And ironically, we see that in the book of of Galatians, uh -huh. churches that he planted. Okay. So he is rebuking and correcting. Come on, guys. I know, totally. Like, but these guys, he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that. So I don't think that's an appropriate interpretation okay. here. I don't think because we just don't see that tone of Paul in his letters, which we have seen in other letters. Yeah. Okay. He doesn't, he doesn't, here's a problem. Let me address that problem. Here's another problem. Address it, which yeah. he does in other places. Exactly. He, there's, it's not really a tone of rebuke. Okay. So I think the other thing is it helps us to better understand how broad and uh, wide sweeping mm -hmm. this gospel is. Mm -hmm. This gospel needs to be preached to those who are already saved or already justified or declared righteous or having a right standing with mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. These folks already have a right standing with God. But Paul is going to say, I think, but it's so much more than that. <laughs> it's so much more than just being saved. Mm -hmm. I want to overwhelm you with how robust and thorough and widespread and sweeping this gospel is. It changes absolutely everything. And Paul wants him to see that. Now, Martin Luther, the, the, the reformer, Martin Luther, he, when he got to Romans 6, 
I mean, the book of Romans for Martin Luther was like this watershed moment for him, which radically changed him mm -hmm. and led him to do the things that he did um, to sort of help the, the, the Roman Catholic Church see the errors of their ways theologically. Mm -hmm. of actually, Romans 1.16 was that sort of that linchpin verse for him to help, you know. But as he got, was studying and reading through the book of Romans, when he got to Romans 6, he said this in his writing, he says, Romans 6 is the gospel to Christians. Mm. He says, I need that preached to me every day. And I think he, what he's saying is, I know that I'm saved, but this message what we, of my new identity and my, this new humanity that God has and how I live apart from the reality that sin doesn't have to be my master today mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how I've now been unified with the God of the universe and how that changes everything for me. Like Paul is saying, or Martin Luther is saying, Christians need that every day. Mm -hmm. We need to be reminded of that every day. Peter, in his own writing, says, I'm writing this to you to remind you of your inheritance. Mm -hmm. I'm remind you of the riches found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He, did, he says, so much more I write that so that when I'm gone, I'm dead, that you have this reminder. He, he knew that he needed to be reminded mm -hmm. of it. He knew his readers needed to be reminded of it. You and I today, I think this is so important, you know, John, and you and I have talked about this, not just as we've studied through this, you know, now, but just in our own <laughs> lives, you yeah. know, just reminding each other of the, the, the beauty, the, the, but also the real practicalness mm -hmm. of the gospel, right. how it not only informs us, but transforms us and, re, and sort of reframes everything in life. Mm -hmm. Can we imagine a people? And this has been our prayer. <laughs> this has been my prayer. This has been many people's prayer, that the bridge would be a people, that the gospel would change absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. There's nothing outside of the scope of the power of the gospel and what it transforms. Mm -hmm. Whether it's marriages, whether it's our finances, not necessarily that we become rich, but that we use our finances for that very purpose mm -hmm. of the gospel. Whether it's our relationships, our jobs, um, our hobbies, our time, our homes, our houses, everything that the gospel would see everything through the light of the beauty and the grandeur of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And Paul saying, you who have believed, I desire to preach this gospel mm -hmm. to you again. Mm -hmm. You know, lest you maybe <laughs> just say like, well, I'm good and I'm saved and I got this. Yeah. You know, uh, man. Yeah. So, so much can be said about that. I think it's, that's something certainly over the last few years that I've grown in personally mm -hmm. is, is learning to, um, how significant it is to be reminded of those things. And I see it acutely in, in my kids, you know, yeah. raising my children and how important it is for them to understand what their identity, we're going to get there. Yeah, you know, sure. But the identity elements, the things that God says about you now, yeah. being reminded of what that is, that, okay, your behavior is not congruent with what your identity is. Mm -hmm. So the issue is not, this is not an issue of your identity. God already took care mm -hmm. of that for you. Yeah. So now we can sort of compartmentalize what's going on in your life in that particular moment and totally. how you sort of address that. This is not an identity issue. Sure. It's quite easy to mix those two things. Totally. Especially in our culture today. Yep. So, um, yeah, I. But we, but we certainly can either forget these truths or we sort of take them for granted and just. Mm -hmm. you know assume them yeah. we talked a lot about assuming, yeah. the, assuming gospel, the gospel even in ourselves yep. um, but yeah man it's being reminded of the gospel is because it is it's so stinking magnificent mm -hmm. we can't even get our head wrapped around it when we're really dialed mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. studying it and learning it we can't quite fathom it anyways yep. so at other times when we're not so heavily connected to it it's so easy to, to let it be for sure. Just sort of in, in the background. It's yeah. important. It's there, but it's not It's not helping us mature over and over and mm -hmm. over. Anyway. Yep. So yeah, it's always, good. It's good. We didn't plan on this or yeah. saying this, but I want to share this, and I hope it's okay that I do. Hmm. I, you know, as sort of the sorrow and the grief that you guys have been going through with the pa passing of your father. Yeah. And so, I mean, one of the things that in the in the – Obviously, I've spent time with you guys and spent time with your mom and your sister. And I think one of the remarkable things that I've, I've been witness to mm -hmm. and I'm thankful for, my family's been witness to, is this very thing. Is that the gospel is informing and transforming you guys even in the midst of some, mm -hmm. some of the deepest sorrow. Mm -hmm. 
that when I hear like your mom saying, mm -hmm. um, you know, in her sadness, mm -hmm. in her sorrow, saying things of, but I know where Mike is. Mm -hmm. And I, he was looking forward to that. He didn't question that. And there's, there's a celebration, you know, uh, of that. How do you celebrate sorrow? We mm -hmm. The only way that you can celebrate that mm -hmm. is through the lens of the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that doesn't remove grief. That doesn't take away the pain, as you intimately know. But it's remarkable. It really is. It's only through the gospel that we can say, but, you know, there's something beyond this. Mm -hmm. And that thing beyond this is presence with Christ. Mm -hmm. That's the gospel. Yeah. You know? Um, so anyways, that's mm -hmm. a little bit bragging about you guys a little bit, mm -hmm. but, but that's the infusing mm -hmm. of the gospel, the sort of bringing, oh, I text this out to you, to, mm -hmm. to Cordy, bringing Jesus, the gospel into everything. Mm -hmm. uh, man, like, um, I think that's what he's saying here, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, we'll, we'll we're going to talk a, little, a lot more about that. but <laughs> so. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for, yeah, just complimenting us. Yeah. We don't deserve, I mean, we're, we're just leaning into Jesus in the midst of all sure. that. Sure. And I'm super grateful that that's true for my whole family. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, man, I, I know for me to be encouraged, even in how my mom is navigating the seas now, and my sister and my yeah. wife and my kids, and we're all doing that together. And, man, I'm, I'm super, super, super grateful that we can... Um, we can trust Jesus in the midst of it, yeah. and we have that hope that allows us to do so. Yeah. So anyway, sure. totally. Um, so we didn't get to sixteen and seventeen, which was going to be the focus of today. Yes. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I think it's actually good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Because it'll help us also transition into eighteen if we get into eighteen yeah. next week. Yeah. So start looking ahead with us. Yep. This week, prepare yourselves for covering maybe 16 and 17, maybe 18 next week? I think we'll get into 18. <laughs> okay. So this has been good. I, I'm trying to think, did we miss anything that we wanted to cover in those verses? I don't know if we did. We have, we have so many copious notes here. Yeah. Um, no, we didn't. I think we're okay. We're good? Yeah. There's, there's some more stuff there, but we'll, yeah. Yep. I always we'll consider cover. that's just, maybe that's just for you and, yeah. you, you and I to there you go. talk about cool. and grow in. Okay, so how about if I yeah. take our five bullet points here and, sure. and summarize? Yeah. Okay, so we, we're we going to sort of jump down to verse 8 here. That Paul 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 is expressing his uh, sentiments for the Romans. Yep. And in verse 8, this is, these are your words, so feel free to jump oh, yeah. in here. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, verse 8, he expresses his thankfulness for for the Romans and, and what's happening with their faith being uh you know, being spread, reported all over the world. Then in 9 and 10, he is um, praying for them in a way. He's telling them how that I, how I, he's praying for them constantly, mm -hmm. and he's praying that he'll be able to uh, be there with them. And 11 and 12, sort of expressing this, um, this hope of what they're going to get by being together. Yeah. And in a way, his love for them, even mm -hmm. though these are this sort of a, um, like we said, he, he may not know a lot of them or yeah. any of them personally, mm -hmm. but this expression of, uh, of looking forward to being together with them and and uh, the brotherhood that it is to, to be united with them in Christ. Yeah. Um, and then, let's see, f uh, thirteen and fourteen, yeah, moving to, his indebtedness or obligation yep. to be a part of uh, uh, reminding them mm -hmm. of the gospel. Yep. And and then finally, again, him his looking forward to being with them in 15. I'm eager. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly why it's Rome that yep. he chose here, but we uh, we certainly get the picture that he has anticipation about being there with them. Totally. Too. Yep. So that's sort of just a little bit of a, in a nutshell, what's happening yeah. here. And, and then we get to the linchpin of 16 for yep. Martin Luther uh, next Boom. week. Yeah. Okay. Can I really quick, so maybe, so I'll, like, one of the things I want to just, you and I talked briefly about this, uh, two minutes, okay. sorry. Um, the credentials of Paul, mm. Paul's credentials. Now remember, Paul was probably one of the, in the mm -hmm. Jewish sense, a religious elite, 
uh, probably in an educational and philosophical sense, an elite mm -hmm. seen in the Ro uh, by the Romans. He was mm -hmm. a Roman Empire, uh, Roman uh, citizen, but he doesn't use any of that in his credentials and his sort of his writing to these people. He says, first and foremost, I'm a servant or a slave of Christ. Verse one. Second, I'm apostle of Christ by his by his appointing. Mm -hmm. Two, I've been set apart for the gospel. Mm -hmm. And three, I'm a missionary to the Gentiles. And I find that ironic to a people that so valued power, mm -hmm. so valued education, so valued philosophy, so valued worldly wisdom. Paul doesn't stand upon any of those credentials. He stands upon the credentials of Jesus Christ appointing him to something mm -hmm. and his voluntary act to make, I'm a slave. Mm -hmm. No one in their right mind at this time some say that there are six million slaves during this time that Paul mm. wrote. No one in their right mind would have said, I voluntary, voluntarily take on slavery. Mm -hmm. But he said, I'm going to voluntarily take on slavery to Christ because I know that he's not like the slave masters of the world. That his burden, his yoke is light. It's freedom. It's, it's victory. It's salvation. It's new identity. It's, it's salvation to the world. And mm -hmm. so Paul willingly takes that on. And that's the credentials that Paul gives to write to, as he writes to the Romans. Mm -hmm. He could have used others. He could have told them how well educated he was or his, how many letters he has after his name or his experience as he travels. Or he's, you know, he's, he's totally cultured because he's traveled the, the world. He doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm a servant and I'm appointed by God. There's a parallel of humility in Jesus and in what Paul's doing. Oh, here, yeah, right? for sure. So, yeah, yep. just hang your hat on that a little bit. Totally, <laughs> for sure. All yeah. right, you want to pray for us? Yeah, let's pray. Okay. Father, thank you for um, that some many years ago, um, you uh, communicated your gospel to people so that today we could hear it over and over and over again so that we can believe it. It's not just in the hearing, but it's in that we believe it to be true and we desire it for um, to saturate us deeply, that the word of Christ would dwell within us deeply and that we would be the avenue or the conduit of that gospel to the world. Um, thanks, Father, for an opportunity to, to participate with you actively in that as we participate with your church actively in that. Um, so, Lord... It is not for Sunday morning that we share your word necessarily. And it's not necessarily just for us that we share it. It's the equipping and the encouragement of the church as we are sent out now into the world. That Monday morning we wake up and we go to our jobs or we spend time with our kids or we're in our neighborhoods or we go on a trip or uh, whatever it may be. Maybe we're, we're alone. But Lord, that we're reminded that we're never truly alone with you. And we're reminded that you want us to participate in the sharing of your good news to the world. And Lord, that is a grace. That is a free gift. That is a, you don't look at us as we have to say all the right words and do all the right things. Because Lord, it is your grace that you have saved us. It is your grace that we are in, uh, in service and in ministry with you and others. And it's by grace, by your power, that we share Jesus with the world around us, our families, our neighborhood, our work, where we live, where we play, where we learn. Lord, we just thank you that uh, we belong to you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, try to, try to read it all the way through. The whole Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You guys try to do that. Maybe we'll try to, re yeah, encourage you guys to read it. Yeah. Give it a whirl. <laughs> it's great. All right. All right. Next week. Yep. See you. All right. See you.